Today an article came out in Al Jazeera stating that the Boogaloo Boy movement has adopted a new tactic and that tactic is agorism and also counter-economics. Now, as somebody who has self-identified as an agorist for many years and who has read Sam Konkin, who coined the term, and who lives these principles on a daily basis and associates with people who live these principles on a daily basis, I can tell you that what was described that these Boogaloo boys are doing is not agorism. Uh, I would not associate, and neither I know that the people that I who are my colleagues would never associate with BLM or Three Percenters or the Boogaloo Boys. We don't stand for any of the things that they stand for and actually the things that they stand for are anathema to the principles that we hold dear. The main one of those is that the people are the market and free people equal free markets. Free the markets, free the people. That's what we're about. I saw this coming. In typical Vince Stradamus fashion, I saw this coming for many months, and as a matter of fact, in my newsletter, Counter Markets, in November, the November issue, I wrote an article about what I was seeing happening, and I just want to read that article because it says all the things that I want to say. So I'm going to read that article, but I'm also going to say that I will no longer be using this term. It's not important to use the term. The principles are there. I was living by these principles and I was embodying this before I even knew the term agorist. For a decade before that, I had existed in the counter economy and I was an avowed libertarian and a seeker of liberty. I didn't even know that there was a label for the thing that I was doing. So I don't need the label and neither do you. If you live by these principles, then you don't need the label. The only people that need these labels are people looking for an identity not people who are looking to actually act in the world. But agorists act. So here's the article that I wrote in November in Counter Markets. The title is, A Message to the Armchair Agorist. I had a recent conversation on a new podcast, and the host told me toward the beginning of our dialogue that his libertarian associates and the people who claim to be part of the, quote, liberty community, as far as he can tell, quote, basically fall into two camps. One camp is fundamentally the Libertarian Party, and the other camp consists of agorists. He said that he fell squarely within the second camp, the agorists. I found this statement to be remarkable. When, in 2016, I discovered the work of Samuel Konkin, the philosopher-economist who coined the term agorism, and began self-identifying as an agorist, I could count on one hand the individuals with whom I was familiar who were talking about the concept. My first tweets using the term agorism are on July 24th, 2016, and I remember at that time putting myself on a mission to popularize the concept among the liberty community. At the time, the hippest thing that a libertarian could call himself or herself was an anarcho-capitalist, an ANCAP. For better or worse, that term was co-opted, starting with the campaign of Donald Trump, by individuals who turned out to have an affinity for coercive state violence and who seemed to many of us on the outside to be ethno-nationalists or at least apologists for ethno-nationalism. The most stark example of this shift is Stefan Molyneux, who was my own guru before he became a Trump supporter who plies his audience with the narrative of racial superiority based on IQ studies. As I realized the power and promise of the vision of a stateless society, anarcho-capitalism is an ideology concerned almost exclusively with theory. Agorism is a practice. As more people who are not practicing agorists start to use the word to identify themselves, I see a risk of a dilution and eventual loss of the concept. In this article, I am going to give a definition of the theory and practice of agorism as I understand it so that this self-identifying newcomer, the armchair agorist, can be cognizant of what he is signing up for. The root of the word agorism is the Greek word agora. The agora was the public space in ancient Greek cities and towns where the open air marketplace existed. Further to the east, this space is still known as bazaar or souk. The Greek agora was generally a central square. It was a place not just for trading goods and services, but for trafficking in ideas. Philosophers would debate in the agora. Art and music would be seen and heard. News of far-off lands would be told to eager crowds by caravan captains. 
The Agora was a generally unregulated space, at least by the laws of the state. If you had goods to sell and could find an unoccupied space in which to sell them, the Agora was generally open to you. The Agora was a free market. In referencing this artifact of ancient Western culture, Samuel Konkin III, who first coined the term agorism, sought to place the notion of the free market at the beginning of our current civilization. The free market, for an agorist, is the pure initial state from whence we came, and it is where we wish to travel in the future. Agorism, ide agorism ideologically is classified as an anarchist philosophy. As such, the agorist believes, one, the most preferable society is one with the least amount of coercive violence. Two, the state defined as, quote, that group which claims a monopoly on coercive violence in a given geographic region is the primary violent actor in modern societies. Three, a free market defined as an economy devoid of state interference is synonymous with a stateless society and is, therefore, a proper and preferable goal. What, differenti what differentiates agorism from other anarchist philosophies and practices is that agorism is the practice of using counter-economics to replace a command economy, an unfree market, with the free market. Counter-economics is the tool of the agorist. Counter-economics, as defined by Konkin, is the practice and study of counter-economic acts. He defines a counter-economic act as all non-coercive action committed in defiance of the state. This definition is very important to keep front of mind. There is a trend among those who call themselves agorists to associate acts like growing peppers in their backyard as part of their agorist practice. However, unless growing peppers in your backyard without the permission of the state is expressly prohibited by the state, your gardening is not counter-economic in nature. It is not agorism. However, selling those peppers on the street corner without a business license or other required permit would, most definitely, be acting as a counter-economist. Not all counter-economists are agorists. There are plenty of economic actors in the world who are either trafficking in contraband goods and services, i.e. drug dealers and prostitutes, or are not in total compliance with government rules and regulations, i.e. an all-cash business that doesn't report all of their earnings to the tax authorities. The former is operating in what Konkin defines as the black market. The latter is operating in the gray market. The black and gray markets are synonymous with the counter economy, and it is from these labels that we get the black and gray colors of the agorist flag. However, most black and gray marketeers are not embracing the counter economy for ideological reasons. They are committing counter economic acts in pursuit of profit. This is what makes agorism so powerful. Konkin writes in An Agorist Primer, Agorism can be defined simply. It is thought and action consistent with freedom. In this case, the freedom in question is the freedom present in the free market. Agorism is the practice of thinking and acting in a manner consistent with the free market. The agorist is the embodiment of the free market. The agorist acts. He actively seeks out and participates in black and gray markets. He actively chooses not to get licensing or permits from the state. He acts in defiance of regulations, not in compliance. This takes courage. This is not a path for everyone. However, there is brilliance in Konkin's, in Konkin's recognition that it is through counter-economics that the free market, a stateless society, can be manifested. The brilliance is in the refraining, the reframing of non-compliance as entrepreneurial risk, a cost of doing business. Black and gray markets arise because it is more profitable to do business as an outlaw than to bear the costs of compliance. This is self-evident. It costs far, far less to simply sell illicit Vicodin on the street than to bear the cost of earning your MD so you can legally prescribe them to patients. Konkin saw that if an ideologically conscious cadre of black and gray marketeers traded risk for profit consistently over generations, that the reach and power of the state would be curtailed simply through the pursuit of profit. In a footnote in New Libertarian Manifesto, Konkin lays out a scenario that convinced me of the clear utility of this path. Quote, An example of how this works may be helpful. 
Suppose I wished to receive and sell a contraband or evade a tax or violate a regulation. Let's say I can make $100,000 a transaction. Using government figures on criminal apprehension, always exaggerated in the state's favor simply because they cannot know how much we got away with, I find an apprehension rate of 20%. One may then find out the percentage of those cases that come for trial and the percentage of those that result in conviction, even with a good lawyer. Let's say 25% make it to trial and 50% result in conviction. The latter is high, but we'll throw in the legal fees involved so that even a decision involving loss of legal costs, but acquittal, is still a loss. I therefore incur a 2.5 risk, 0.2 times 0.25 times 0.5 equals 0.025. This is high for most real cases. Suppose my maximum fine is $500,000 or five years in jail or both. Excluding my counter-economic transactions, one certainly cannot count them when deciding whether or not to do them, I might make $20,000 a year so that I would lose another $100,000. It's very hard to ascribe a value to five years of incarceration, but at least in our present society, it's not too much worse than other institutionalization, school, army, hospital, and at least the counter-economists won't be plagued with guilt and remorse. So I weigh 2.5% of $600,000 loss or $15,000 and five years against $100,000 gain. And I could easily insure myself for $14,000 or less to pay all costs and fines. In short, it works." Unquote. Although the numbers work, there is a brutal honesty in the risk being traded. Incarceration is a risk of counter-economics. That's why labeling yourself as an agorist, one who is consistently acting in such a way that risks attracting the violence of the state, is not something to be taken lightly. The fact that people are embracing the black and gray flag is an indication to me that they don't fully understand what those colors signify. To be an agorist is not only to act, but to act in manner consistent with freedom. In an agorist primer, Konkin writes, quote, hold on to the virtue of consistency, the refusal to compromise, to deceive oneself, to sell out, or to be realistic, created agorism." Unquote. I have been both a counter-economist virtually all of, I've been a counter-economist virtually all of my life and an agorist knowingly and unknowingly for many years. I have traded risk for profit and have had successful businesses in the counter-economy, but I have also had my businesses and my freedom taken away from me at various times by agents of the state. I have also faltered in my consistency. I have at times jump through the state's hoops. On every occasion that I have complied, participating in the white market, I have later realized that doing so was mostly a waste of time. The regimes of licensing and permitting are, after all, just a highly evolved and normalized protection racket of the same fundamental type practiced by organized crime since time immemorial. Quote, give us some of your profits or we'll break your legs and burn down your business. You cannot be an agorist in theory. Agorism, by definition, requires action. I sincerely want you to find agorism as rewarding and meaningful an an ideology as I have found it. I have learned so much about myself and the world in which I live through embracing agorist principles and practice. I want to encourage you to orient yourself toward freedom, because agorism does require courage. Embracing the term and the symbols is a first step. I want to invite you to take the next step and learn what this agorism thing is is all about. That's my article from November. But I'm not going to be using this term anymore. I'm still going to be living by the principles, but it's now corrupted, it's now ruined and taken, and that's a shame. But the principles still exist. Hold on to consistency, thought and action consistent with freedom.